I built this, a custom water-cooled mattress topper and system to be able to heat and cool my bed. Much like the much more expensive 8sleep type products, this should in theory mean that you're by heating and cooling yourself rather than the whole room or the whole house, it's way more efficient and effective at being able to regulate your temperature while in bed. For those hot summer nights, being able to just cool the mattress and therefore cool yourself should be way more effective than having a painfully noisy and rather inefficient portable AC unit running and a lot quieter too. And for the cold, you know, winter nights, we can literally preheat the bed so it's nice and warm and cozy when you get into it. But I think we've skipped a bit too far ahead. Let me go back in time to when this wasn't all set up and running and talk you through how I made this thing and what the hell's going on here. As it turns out, I live in the upholstery capital of Britain, which means I have more than one local foam merchant. I went round, gave them the dimensions for a double bed, and they cut out an inch and a half thick chunk for me. I went with a fairly soft foam, as this is meant to basically be an invisible addition to our mattress. I went with an inch and a half, mostly so that it would retain some structural integrity after I've cut a bunch of tubing into it, which brings me nicely onto the next, most annoying part of this process. At first, I bought 8mm tubing, as that's what a lot of PC water cooling uses and what fits the water block I'll be using as well. But once it arrived, I realised there's no way that that is going to be comfortable to lie on every night, especially since I opted for the reinforced variety, making it just extra stiff. And being as thick as it is means actually very little surface area would be covered in the mattress topper and therefore, you know, heat or cooling dissipated. So I bought some 4mm ID tubing instead. I then spent a good day cutting lines into the foam. Initially, I thought that I'd have to cut out a sort of wedge and then glue the wedge back in, but I quickly realized that that was stupid and then I could just carry a vertical channel uh, into the sort of back of the foam and then just push the tubing into it and glue it back together. I measured out where I wanted the runs and worked out how tightly I could turn the tubing without it kinking and then started cutting. It turns out that a double mattress sized bit of foam is quite large and uh, in a small British bedroom surrounded by um, tech shelves, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit tight. But I got it done. I put the tubing in and used contact adhesive to glue the foam back together, sealing the tubing in sight. That took an absolute age too. In fact, I actually ran out of spray adhesive twice, so I ended up just using their sort of gluing spots to mostly hold it in place. One day I hope to go back and add some more adhesive, in theory. So now we've got a tubing filled bit of foam on the bed. Amazing, what next? Well, I should probably show you the key bit of tech that makes this whole thing work. That would be this, the tech. No, not T-E-C-H, T-E-C thermoelectric cooler, also known as a Peltier element. This little thing, well the four of them that are in here, are basically made of two different metals that when you push current into them, create a really cool effect where one side gets cold, draws heat from the outside, and the other radiates that heat outwards, and actually a fair bit more as well. Now as technology connections will happily tell you, Peltier modules kinda suck at cooling. At least, the, you know, the, compared to conventional refrigerant-based systems. But the thing is, because we are limiting how much cooling we actually need to do by only cooling ourselves rather than, say, the whole room, this pack should only draw two to 300 watts, versus over a kilowatt or more for a noisy and frankly less effective than I would like portable air conditioner. So I count that as a win. The magic with Pelche modules is that if you reverse the current flow, i.e. swap the wires around, the heat transfer effect is reversed too. That means with the right control logic, you can make this thing do both heating and cooling. And that's really cool, pun intended. What control logic, you might ask? 
Well, that's where today's sponsor, Gel CPCB, comes in. Their fantastic PCB manufacturing facilities, combined with their ridiculously easy to use designs, a PCB design software, Easy EDA, meant that I could build my very own custom designed board for this very job. They are lightning fast at building the boards, and their new complete fabrication and assembly service means that you don't even have to place the components or solder yourself. The quality is always excellent and is exceptionally good value, plus they ship worldwide too. Check them out at the link in the description if you want to make your own custom boards, or get them to 3D print or even CNC mill something, as they're pretty great for that too. Plus, on the PCB front, they have six layer PCBs for just $5, and if you use the link in the description, there's up to $80 in coupons that you can collect, so go check that out, and thank you to GLC for sponsoring this video. The board itself has gone through quite a number of iterations, all because, well, I'm an idiot. The current revision actually isn't perfect either, but at this point I've bodged it into working, so it'll do for now. Uh, I've spent far too long working on this to not explain at least a little of how this works, so you'll have to bear with me. The big challenge with controlling these techs is that you need a circuit to not only be able to turn them on and off, but to essentially rewire which side is connected to power and which side is connected to ground, ideally without having to, you know, manually flip a connector or switch. It turns out though, that if you use digital switches, aka transistors, you can have four, two connected to power, one on each side, and two connected to ground, again one on each side, and then you just make sure that only one of the transistors per side is enabled, and you're good. Now the reality of designing that is not quite as, uh, as simple as it seems. First, the techs really don't like just being switched on and off, so an inductor and capacitor on each side is a pretty good idea. Next, unless you've got a current regulated power supply, which technically I don't since I'm using a PC power supply, hence the 24 pin and 8 pin power connectors, you'll need current limiting resistors. The trouble I had with this is, well actually this whole project, is that these suckers can draw 6 amps each. Finding MOSFETs and resistors that can handle 300 watts and 24 amps isn't easy, nor is it then easy to get the buggers to work. So I settled for uh, car headlight load resistors, well specifically 4 of them, one for each tech. These specific ones actually aren't my final choice, they're only rated for 50 watts and are actually 6 ohms, which means at 12 volts it's only 24 watts, but I will replace them with 3 ohm 75 watt resistors pretty soon, and I mean they are at least enough to prove the concept. Plus the heating side is way more efficient than the cooling side, so I don't really need full power until next summer. Anyway, with those wired in, the next step is actually on the control front. While my MOSFETs do work, the input side ones in particular get painfully hot, even at basically half current, so I swapped them out for automotive 12 volt fused relays instead. That actually works a treat, uh, and the built-in fuse is pretty nice. Uh, each one's rated for 30 amps at 12 volts, meaning these can more than handle the four techs that I'm looking to use here. As for control, that comes from this little guy, an ESP32. This one is from Unexpected Maker and Adafruit, and it's the Feather S3, and it just slots into the headers on the board. The output signals from this are bumped up to 12 volts by these level shifters, which also control the fans built into the tech module itself. The, uh, the board is running ESP Home with at least this current configuration you see on screen. Uh, everything for this project, by the way, including the PCB files, this config, the lot, is all linked in the GitHub repo in the description if you want to have a play with this yourself. This is not a professional design, and if I were to do it again, well, I would do quite a lot differently, so use it at your own risk. There are a couple of other nice features on the board though. Uh, two 4-pin PWM fan headers, which the ESP can control both via PWM and read the fan speed. And a 2-pin header for this little guy here. A, a negative temperature coefficient thermistor, an NTC thermistor. Basically, it's just a resistor that changes its resistance with heat. 
This specific one is built into a water cooling fitting, which can monitor the water temperature and at least in theory anyway, adjust the heating or cooling accordingly. I am yet to program that in though, but the hardware's there. And that brings us nicely onto the water cooling part of this. Fantax graciously sent over their tiny and beautiful P200 Air Mini case and the genuinely stunning Glacier R260C Reservoir and Pump Combo unit to use here. These will be linked in the description at Overclockers if you want either or both. The case is perfect for this. It comes with a couple fans in the front to help airflow. It's small and sleek and relatively quiet too. It's perfect. As for the pump, that being a D5 means that it's powerful and still fairly quiet too. Oh, and really reliable. The reservoir is also perfect. It fits in the case really well, screwing into the front fan mounts to secure it in, and has extra uh, two extra ports, or actually a few extra ports, uh, that I you know, can make use of for filling pretty easily, and obviously monitoring temperature as well. So let's get building the system then. First things first, let's get the reservoir in and tech mounted, and then we know what to run tubing to. I'm opting for the most classy mounting solution for the tech here, which is a block of wood zip tied to the bottom of the case, and then that zip tied to the block of wood. I'll keep it nice and sturdy and in place, right? <laughs> Now, I've got these 8mm bar fittings, but I also wanted the bed portion to be detachable, so I opted to get quick disconnect fittings as well. Now, as I said earlier, I'm an idiot, so while these are quick disconnect fittings, they don't seal themselves when you disconnect them, which isn't exactly ideal. Still, I'm gonna put uh, sort of opposing ends on each side so that when you do disconnect them, you can basically make two loops, one for the bed and one for the system, which I've actually got here. It is a fully sealed loop until I pull this collar. Um, I do need to step the actual hose itself down from the eight mil to the four mil, which is why I have eight to four mil adapters. And I'm also gonna use zip ties to secure the tubing to the fittings, just in case. There is a lot of tubing, 30 meters of it, give or take, in the bed, which does mean that there's going to be quite a lot of pressure needed to flow the water through that line, and I'd rather not wake up with a mildly flooded bedroom. Just my preference, you know? Now the reason for my utmost of high-tech solutions to lift the tech higher uh, is actually to lift it into the sort of the path of air from the front of the case. Um, uh, look, like I said, this isn't professional, uh, but you know, there you go. Otherwise it is all wired and plumbed up, so I think it's time to get this thing filled up as well. Luckily the amazing Fantex reservoir has a bunch of spare pores, so with a spare bit of tubing I can fill the thing up and just with a water bottle as well, and then cycling the pump on uh, to sort of fill the loop itself should be good. I didn't realise how much water the whole system would need but also it's kind of less than I thought it would be as well. The, the four millimeter tubing really is pretty tiny, so it doesn't need that much water to fill it up. So I finally have it all set up. It's, uh, it's taken quite a while to actually bleed the loop. Uh, turns out that surface tension is a pain in the ass and um, it's, there's still a couple of bubbles in the motor, but I'm hoping that especially by heating it up, that changes the properties of the water and that might help bleed it. I'll be leaving the pump on for a good couple days just to make sure that it's all bled nicely, but it is working. Now I currently have it on the heat setting because I mean, it's, it's, it's middle of November, end of November, we want the, the nice warmth in the bed rather than cooling effects. And what I would say is that what I've worked out is there's a lot of thermal mass here. Both the water itself takes just quite a while to heat up. And then even then the actual mattress itself absorbs a fair amount of the heat. The mattress topper, the foam, that absorbs heat, and then we have us too. So I think especially for the, uh, for the heating, this is gonna be a turn it on a couple hours before bed, leave it you know, running just to heat everything up, and then by the time we get into bed, it'll be nice and warm and we can turn it off and generally we're fine enough as it is. For summer and for, for the cooling, it is gonna need to be running the whole time, although that's kind of to be expected. The one thing that I would say is that the uh, load resistors that I had to add in, which I've actually added the correct ones now, these are the full uh, 2.7 ohm 100 watts, which means 4.4-ish amps, which is actually less than the techs are rated for. They're rated for at least 6 amps, 
Um, but even then, these uh, load resistors are getting ridiculously hot and I'm kind of concerned. They are in the path of the airflow, so it's not too bad, but yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on those ones, especially since there's a nice little bit of wood at the bottom. Um, you know, gotta have some fun, don't we? Taking a look at the, uh, the, the measurements, one of the nice things about having the temperature sensor is that I can actually monitor how quickly it is heating up. It's taking probably about 10 minutes to do two degrees Celsius, which isn't ideal. Uh, although saying that, it's currently at 20.7 degrees Celsius, and we only really want this to be, you know, a few degrees warmer than the room itself, really. It just needs to be not freezing cold when we get into it, so I don't think that's too big a deal. Um, and yeah, I think there's there's still a lot more on the automation side to do. I'll probably be using Node Red um, to do things like basically have temperature set points, have it automatically turn on at, you know, 5 p.m. whatever, so that it's warm when we get into bed, whatever ends up working. Um, and even things like leaving the pump on while we're, you know, like while it's still just circulating fluid so that it gets a, an accurate reading. In fact, it's actually just jumped up to 22.5. Wonderful. But yeah, reasonably, I, I, I'm reasonably happy with it. It's all working, which is kind of a miracle with how janky this whole thing is. Um, and yeah, I don't recommend that you build this. There is links in the description if you want to have a look, but I, I wouldn't if I were you. This, this, this feels a bit too jank. So that is my DIY bed cooler. It's going to be great for those cold winter nights and those sweltering summer nights too. I'm looking forward to testing it out properly, you know, extended testing and adding a load more features, mostly on the automation front. If you do want to have a play with this, like I said, there is a GitHub link in the description. I can't recommend you actually do this. This has been a lot more of a pain in the ass than I thought it would be, but I guess all projects are. But yeah, there you go. If you're interested in building your own custom boards, check out JLC in the description. Check out all of the other links in the description if you want to support this idiocy. And uh, yeah, if you want to see more videos, hopefully not like this one, because, uh, well, actually, I'm going to keep doing projects because I'm me. Hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. Check out my other projects, the open source tools uh, that actually work in the, uh, in the end cards. And yeah, also, you can pick them up in the description. It's osrtt.com. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next video.